Hello, everyone. This is Monica. We'll be starting in about two minutes. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the March 12th COVID-19 Vaccine Advisory Committee meeting. Thank you for being here. Thank you to our CVAC members and staff. Mom, we can't yeah. hear you. Okay. Is this any better? I can, I can hear you. You can hear? Okay. Let me start from the beginning, just in case. Elke can't hear me. Dr. Burgess, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Uh, can anybody else uh, comment that whether they can hear Monica? I can, I can hear, hear fine. You, Monica. I can hear you fine, Monica. It's Randy Hudspeth. Great. Thank you my so much. That was my, my error. <laughs> no problem, but it's good to know before I go further down with our, with our comments. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So I'll start from the beginning. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. Thank you to our CVAC members, our staff, our ASL interpreter, who has a big job throughout our meeting. Thank you so much for your work um, and all others joining the meeting or listening in otherwise. Thank you. Uh, as you know, today our intent is not to have any votes on any prioritization matters, but rather to provide a forum for discussion. So we'll be discussing any areas still remaining prior or still requiring prioritization for vaccination in Idaho. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? Perfect, thank you. So please let us know in the chat if you are attending as a designee for one of our members. Uh, and always, we encourage you to take a look at the list of who is here today rather than spending that time on introductions since we have such a big group. I also uh, received notification that Tony Lawson will be attending for Brian Whitlock uh, at the Idaho Hospital Association. So welcome, Tony. One more note. As you can see on the slide, although these meetings are not required to adhere to open meeting law in Idaho, we always do our best to, con to conduct them in the most transparent manner possible. So information is out on the internet, agendas are posted, notes are pre uh, presented and whatnot so that you can stay apprised of what is going on. All right, let's take a look at the agenda for today. So as always, we'll hear some updates, a welcome and some opening remarks with our chair, Dr. Patrice Burgess and Elki Shah Tulloch, our executive secretary. Then we're going to hear from Salome Mwanji from the Idaho Office for Refugees on vaccine administration experiences and realities on the ground with the refugee community in Idaho. Thank you, Salome, for being here and doing that for us. Then we'll spend the bulk of our time today, and of course we have a one hour meeting, a shorter meeting, but we're going to spend the bulk of our time talking about further considerations and having discussion regarding Idaho Group 3. So again, those areas pending decision still. And then we'll wrap up and talk about our next steps. I always like to invite you and remind you to take a look at the ground rules at the bottom of the agenda that was distributed and that is posted online. It's always a good reminder as we get started for our meeting. And a couple of other reminders, actually I think just one today, uh, just that chat reminder, we've been doing great at having live discussion and really trying to focus on using the hands up function and having as much live together discussion as possible and using the chat for sharing resources and just quick questions and information there. 
So I encourage us to continue to do that today. And with that, I think I'm ready to pass it over to Dr. Burgess and Elke for welcome opening remarks and updates. Thank you so much. And uh, again, appreciate everybody's work. Uh, this has been a long haul and we're kind of near in the end. So uh, very much appreciate everybody's work. We do have a electronic vote in progress. So you guys all should have received an email about how to do that. And we extended the deadline to Monday so that you could benefit from this discussion today, get any questions answered, clarifications. Uh, and if you've already submitted your vote and you need to change your mind after this meeting or resubmit it before the deadline, uh, we, may, we emailed out instructions on how to do that as well. So today, again, we're not voting. We're just discussing things and uh, allowing time for clarification. So uh, thank you again for attending and I'll hand it over to Elke. Great. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. I really don't have anything else to add at this particular point in time other than thank you all for all of the large amounts of work that you've done in all of these meetings. We will hopefully have some time on our next meeting on the 19th to do some celebrating of all of the work that we've done. Um, we're looking forward to that opportunity and we'll just use today as our chance, as Dr. Burgess and Monica said, to, to have some dialogue um, We've had some kind of open house style, if you will, uh, conversations like this before, but we have a little bit of structure today and some information to share. So looking forward to our conversation. Thanks. Great, thank you. And with that, I would like to invite Salome Mawanji to share with us her presentation, um, which is titled COVID-19 Virus and Vaccine Information for the Limited English Proficient Population. Welcome, Salome. Thank you, Monica, and thank you for inviting me to share some of what we've been doing within the refugee community. We actually took a look at what are the barriers that are in the way of people who came here who have limited English proficiency. And uh, we came up with, obviously, the limited English proficiency. There's also the low health literacy, and this actually is um, a barrier that goes across other populations as well, not just the refugee population or the immigrant population, to where you find even when they're having conversations with their doctors, should the doctor say something like hypertension, they may not realize that the doctor is talking about high blood pressure. Then below that, we also had low literacy in their own languages. So somebody could be speaking in Kiswahili or Kenya Rwanda or Kirundi, but they don't know how to read and write in their languages. So you have to find another way to be able to communicate this, uh, the information about the virus and the vaccine. And then another layer on top of all that is cultural and spiritual beliefs, because we all come from different cultures. And what is it that I believe about diseases and how they're managed that are coming in the way? Or what are the spiritual beliefs that I have? Some people believe that um, this vaccine is uh, the mark of the beast. So how do we have that conversation in a way that we're able to overcome those barriers? Next slide, please. So we found that the steps to the solution, now I'm saying we because I did not work on this on my own, even though I do, I came here as a refugee, I totally understand some of the barriers that uh, we face. I have worked as a Kiswahili interpreter in the community for about 16 years now. So then I also invited other people from within the community, some who are interpreters, some who are uh, community health advisors. So these are people who work with the refugee population to help them navigate around uh, health, the health system, which is really complicated, especially when you come from a place that probably did not ha have a health system to navigate. So I also asked the question, I posed the question to a pharmacist who is from Kenya and I asked her, Dr. Kavila, if you were to explain the vaccine, well, the virus, let's start with the virus, explain the virus and then the vaccine to your grandmother who lives in a village in Kenya, how would you do that? And she stopped and thought and she said, oh my goodness, I've never thought, you know, we don't have words like DNA, we don't have words like nuclear, the nucleus or the cell or the, so that's when I realized, okay, so this wasn't me just imagining this, this was a real issue. And once we were able to identify what the barriers were, then we figured out how do we do that? How do we communicate this message 
about the seriousness of the virus and the need for the vaccine without changing the message. And just because I'm using a lower register or I'm using words that are not as complicated doesn't mean that I need to water down the message. So what we did was to sit down and figure out what are we going to say that is going to make people realize just how serious this virus can be. I mean, there's obviously people who are saying it's not an issue, it's not a big deal. Um, it's being politicized. However, the truth is that for those people, we have had deaths within the refugee community. And let's talk about that. Let's talk about when it goes into your lungs, that's when you're in real trouble and it could have lasting damage. And so we were able to unpack that picture of the worst case scenario and just to show people who are the people who are at risk. It's the older people. It's the people who have pre-existing conditions that are at risk for the disease going down. And even if it doesn't kill you, you could still have ramifications to your physical body that will follow you for the rest of your life. And then after that, we realized if we package this message in a way that is um, communicatable, such that if somebody just looking at it is able to figure out, oh, this is what they're talking about, then we would actually be able to invite them in. We noticed that a lot of times people were communicating some of their fears, but we were not listening. The community has not been listening. For example, people would say, oh, I've heard that if you get the shot, you'll turn into a donkey, or if you get the shot, you're going to grow a third leg. And in as much as we may want to laugh that away and just say, oh, you're, you're being dramatic, the truth is they've heard something about mutation. And since we don't have words like mutations, so they're talking about the fact that my physical body is going to be changed. And that's the fear that I have, that if I take this vaccine, then my body is going to mutate. And therefore, that's why they were having these fears. Next slide, please. So then we looked at the barriers that we had and the solution that we had and we we were trying to figure out how we're going to move forward with this and we realized that the best thing that we could do was to lean on the local resources that were already in place we didn't have to reinvent anything so one we tapped into the medical professionals from these communities so that they could shape and then share the message in a way that was equitable and understandable a lot of times you may hear it from your doctor and the, I cannot tell you how many people have told me, oh, this is a white person's disease, or this only happens to this other community because they believe in it. But hearing it from somebody who knows your culture, who comes from your culture, who understands the limitations that you're having. And we were actually able to present the picture of the coronavirus. And you know, we didn't have to break it down and say, this is the S protein and this is, and we just say, this is what you're, you're already familiar with. This right here, is what is being used to develop the vaccine. And then as we drill down, we are able to use simple language and simple diagrams, staying away from the technical terms and being able to actually tell them something like, they, everybody knows that the vaccine is different, right? And that is where the resistance is coming from. So we were able to tell them that this vaccine works in a way such that it's almost as if, you know, when you have a wanted poster that says, if you see this guy, this guy is a bad guy and he needs to be arrested. That's exactly what the vaccine is doing. So it's introducing that image of the bad guy into your body. And so when Corona comes in, your body already recognizes, oh, this is a guy we were told about. And so we need to go ahead and arrest him because they already knew that we were not, you're not introducing a weakened uh, version of the virus in order to build immunity. After we were able to do that, we also realized if I just show up at somebody's house and say, hey, let's talk about the coronavirus and the vaccine, nobody's really going, I, we, I don't have that trust. So we have been able to leverage the existing relationships within the community to invite people and make them feel included. So that includes interpreters, as an interpreter, I know that if I tell somebody go get the vaccine, they will do it because I said it. But I don't want people to get the vaccine because I'm saying it. I want you to have the information and then make an informed decision based on the information that you have. And if you want to ask questions, we have a forum where you can get your questions answered. And so we're working with interpreters. We're working with mental health providers. We are working with uh, community health advisors. And so anybody who works with refugees in a trusted relationship has been invited in 
in order to leverage this information. We're equipping them with the, with the message that we have tooled in a way that is easier to communicate rather than have an interpreter spinning their wheels trying to figure out how do I say mRNA in a language, in a way that the languages don't have that. You know, whether a lot of the African languages I know for sure do not are not technical. And then after that, basically sending the message that I hear you. So listening and addressing what is being said and what is not being said. One of the big aha moments was when we realized that just because you're talking doesn't mean that I'm listening. So how do we move from listening, uh, from, from hearing and into listening and after listening, addressing what you're saying or what you're not saying? Next slide, please. So then that's when we thought, okay, so let's have these conversations that are going to flow first by dialing down the harm, by recognizing that safety is an inside job. Just because you tell me that it is safe doesn't mean that I'm going to feel safe. You don't know what experiences I have been through where somebody told me that I was safe and then I was ambushed and I probably lost family members. So uh, helping people develop that sense of safety on their own, at their own pace, and meeting them where they are at. And while we're doing that, acknowledging trauma and its effects. A lot of refugees who are here have been through some horrible, traumatic situations and experiences. So also acknowledging that and saying, I understand that this could be the reason why you're being hesitant. I understand that this experience that you went through predisposes you to not trust new things and new situations. Along with that was also seeking to restore choice. People who come here as refugees have had choice taken away from them. When you're living in a refugee camp, you eat the food that they give you. you if they tell you you're going to America, you go to America. You may want to go to Australia because that's where your family is. But you, go, so now we wanted to get to the point to where people don't feel like we're telling you this is what you're going to do. We are offering you the information that we have available from trusted sources. I'm a trusted source. Your doctor is a trusted source. Your mental health provider is a trusted source. You're, so having that information available from trusted forces, sources and then offering them the options for them to realize that it's not just the Pfizer or the Moderna. Now we have Johnson & Johnson and you get to choose. At some point there was... Um, talk about having a clinic where refugees go to. And while that sounds like a really good idea, it goes back into feeling like, wait a minute, why am I being isolated? Why am I being targeted and being put into a different clinic just for refugees? What is wrong with this vaccine such that I can only get it in a clinic that is made for refugees? So then we were able to say, hey, you can go to wherever you want to. If you don't want to go to St. Alphonsus, you can go to St. Luke's or you can go to primary health. And all these systems have put um, systems in place, processes in place to where if somebody calls and they do not speak English very well or they need an interpreter, those interpreters are available to help them navigate that. And then finally, letting them know that this is voluntary. Nobody is saying that you have to take this. Here's the information and it's up to you to do whatever it is that you want to do with it. But now that you know, you can make a choice one way or the other with the right information rather with all the stuff that we have we've been hearing it as well right but you can imagine how much more complicated it gets when you do not understand english or even understand the technical nature of the language so that's it in a nutshell uh last saturday we were actually able to host a training and we had about 44 people show up from the refugee community we chose to do it just in english so that we could reach the interpreters and the other people who work with refugees because there's still people who you know speak english like you and i and yet when somebody asks me about the virus i'm at a loss as to how to explain it because i don't know how to say mrna or dna or whatever so we were able to do that training we had an amazing robust question and answer time when people were able to say this is what i'm hearing in the community and this is what people are afraid of and if we had this then maybe we could move things forward and so really encouraged by the response that we got we had two pharmacists running the training one is dr kavila who's with the inter she's the director of pharmacy at intermountain hospital 
And the other one is Dr. Kennedy Wainaina. He's a retail pharmacist at Fred Meyer. And these are people that they have probably seen within the community. So obviously the information coming from them was um, a positive experience. So that is what we've done so far. And we're looking forward to having more forums and probably going into the Magic Valley with these refugees being resettled in Twin Falls as well. And we would like to hold a similar training there as well soon. That's it. Thank you so much, Salome. Um, wonderful information and just really uh, brings our awareness to so many different aspects of our community and things to think about doing this important work. So thank you very much for taking the time to put this together and share this with us to widen our thinking and perspectives as we move forward. Um, I also want to uh, just make sure that we recognize that Salome is also a member of the CVAC, uh, the committee. So we uh, appreciate your perspective on the committee level as well. Thank you so much. You're welcome. With that, I think we are ready to turn to our next discussion. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Burgess and Elke to start us off. Okay, I think you can go on to the next slide here. So this is the vote that is pending, like I mentioned, uh, that you should have received by email. Some of you have voted already, some of you uh, haven't, and we just wanted to open up some discussion today to kind of help people with their decision. Again, we're not voting today, uh, just discussing. The vote will be electronic. Um, and let us know, you know, if you have any um, this, uh, difficulties with the electronic process, uh, either originally voting or changing your vote or whatever that might be. So if you remember back uh, last, just last week, we approved the top box and uh, after much discussion, alternating folks with at least one medical condition with uh, the general population in that age group uh, down to age 45. And um, then we have to figure out what to do with people under the age of 45. And we've had a lot of public comments. Um, I'm sure you've read them just as I have. Um, but really the effort was, particularly in those higher age groups, we know that a healthy 55 year old is still at pretty high risk and having them wait till all of the people with medical conditions got vaccinated uh, could, could put them uh, at risk because we know that age alone is a pretty high risk factor. So now that we're down to 45, we are presenting you all with two choices. Uh, one is to continue in that same vein, as you see over here on option B, with the age bands alternating with a medical condition, without a medical condition, all the way down uh, till we get uh, to 16 to 24, and basically all the way, all the way down to 16. Uh, versus uh, the other option over here, option A, is after we get down to the 45 age group, opening it up to 16 to 44 with a medical condition, and this two weeks, um, I think, is really just an estimate. Uh, we always uh, leave that to the decision of the districts and the governor based on how many appointments are open, what the vaccine supply is, that type of thing. So it's really just the concept of saying, okay, everybody with a medical condition between 16 and 44 can go before the general population between 16 and 44 versus the alternating back and forth uh, between medical conditions and general population all the way down to the age of 16. So that's the vote that's out there pending that's due on Monday. And um, I think uh, I'd like to open that up for discussion. If anybody wants to ask questions, make comments, uh, whatever, this is your time really for discussion. Excellent, thank you. I see Mel Levitin uh, has her hand up. Go ahead, Mel. Yeah, just a question, and I know I know I'm going to be asking you to look in your crystal ball, but do you, do you have a ballpark idea of where you know every district and region is different, but where the first place or approximately what what's the time frame we're looking at um, to do this 16 to 44 year old to I, and I realize again that, that that could go either way by weeks. I, I get that, but just a ballpark idea. We have some population estimates, I think, in, in some slides uh, that might help us at least estimate. Obviously, our vaccine supply 
is variable. Um, right now, I think we're pushing 50 to 60,000 doses per week, but we don't always know if it's going to, you know, fluctuate. Um, but would it be easy to pull up those population slides by eight? Uh, I think they were in the uh, kind of appendix. <clears throat> There they are. Um, so this might help a little bit with your question, though. Um, so um, you can see in yellow there the different uh, people with at least one medical condition. I think one of the things that we struggle with a little bit is who has already been vaccinated. We know some of these people are healthcare workers, for example, or they're in some of the frontline workers, and so it's really challenging for us to know. Um, of these overall numbers, how many have already received the vaccine? And then the other challenge, of course, is uh, as uh, well made very well illustrated, uh, it's people's choice. So we don't know out of that group how many are going are going to want the vaccine. So these would be the the high numbers, but I would assume you could take a little bit off of that based on those two factors. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Dr. Burgess. I don't see any other hands up at this time. Uh, I'm wondering if there's anything else in the chat, but I don't think there is at this time. I don't see anything else right now. Oh, let's break that. Uh, Christine Newhoff has her hand up. Go ahead, Christine. Thank you. Um, I guess just a, a couple of thoughts and it seems like this is probably the uh, as good a time as as any to, uh, to to share them one relating to uh the option b and one relating to the time frames so um you know just as i've as i've been looking at this and and talking to you know our medical uh folks about it 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 seems to me that um vaccinating a say a healthy 34 year old before a frail um uh 20 uh 24 year old just seems probably not uh not ideal and um and effectively these plans get us to everyone in idaho being eligible by the time we get to the end of either of these <clears throat> and so it um on the front of the time frame, one one thing that uh, that I'm wondering about is uh, the extent to which we can or um, or will be able to find ways to increase interest and perhaps enthusiasm among the hesitant, because I, I do have some concern that if we quickly move through all of the people who are enthusiastic about getting the vaccine or, or, you know, know they want it, that we lose the opportunity to use, to use that momentum to help bring along more of the people who are on the fence um, or maybe uh, somewhat hesitant about it. So if we sweep through all of the enthusiastic and uh, are at say 55% of our population being vaccinated, and then we're having to find ways to um, to sort of um, get out the population <laughs> to be vaccinated. It seems to me we might miss an opportunity there um, to be able to again use the momentum to uh, to help get uh, get our community to a level of vaccination that will really allow us to return to something much more akin to to normal. Yeah, thank you, Chris. You reminded me of a couple of things. Um, one is I'm sure you all either heard or read President Biden saying that uh, he wants everyone to be eligible for vaccination by May 1st. Uh, I think our timeline here would accomplish that, but uh, that's one thing that's kind of out there that, that probably people heard. Um, the other thing is, you know, there is some uh, PR advertising, whatever you want to call it, campaign about uh, getting people to accept the vaccine that I think hasn't been completely launched because we've had such short supply. So I don't know if we, if anybody knows the timing of that, but certainly when supply becomes more predictable, uh, which, you know, hopefully is starting to, 
then that educational campaign could be more robust. Uh, right now, it's a little challenging to try to talk people into something when we don't necessarily have enough doses to then provide. <laughs> Thank you. I see that Mel Levitin has her hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, we're, we're working with uh, several groups over in uh, southwestern Idaho and then hopefully soon, well, we're working with them already in uh, south central Idaho. And one of the things we're looking at is it really makes more sense when going out to a small community to offer the vaccine to the whole community, um, especially initially when there's um, uh, the hesitancy to get the vaccination. Um, people from different cultures and varying degrees of, of trust to the medical community overall are um, perhaps more protective of their elders and um, people who are, um, you know, who they view as medically fragile, who are, who are members of their community. And um, so while, you know, I, I'm definitely on, on the side of wanting um, people with disabilities and people with health conditions to, to, get, to get in line first, their communities and their families may not want them in line first. And we have to be respectful of that as well. Um, so I just I just wanted to throw that out there is that that, that when we go to a small town, um, we we need to vaccinate whoever shows up really, um, and then build on that as we go. You know we see it as a long term proposition, so we're going to build on that and eventually capture um, hopefully more people in the long run. So that's that's I just think if we get it opened up to more people, um, it it gives us a better footing in a community. Thank you, Mel. Thank you for that perspective. I wanted to quickly uh, just point your attention to a comment we have from Dr. Carter in the chat and that just kind of builds on what we've been talking about. We have heard it anecdotally that people in prior groups who had decided to wait and see have started to get vaccinated after seeing how things have gone with their peers and nationally. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Uh, let's turn to uh, I'm not sure, Christine, if you still have your hand up from before. From before? Okay. All right. Then I'll I'll, uh, I'll see that Dr. Wyatt has her hand up. Go up. Go ahead, please. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for taking time out of your Friday. Here we are again. So um, excellent presentation about some of the important aspects of communication with many of our populations. And, and I think to Mel's point, also that once we start moving into where we really are focusing on geographic areas or you know industrial or employment areas to target vaccinations i think that we should be at that point that anybody who shows up for their vaccination that day should be able to get one and so when you look at how we triage whether we go with choice a or choice b um really choice a probably captures people who are at higher risk better because once we drop down into folks below age 45, if they're otherwise medically healthy, like they have very low risk for complications, severe complications from COVID. So by going with option A, we are still prioritizing people who may be more um, vulnerable due to health conditions and get through that. And by the time we get then to the age 16 to 44 for the general population, it does allow us to capture pretty much anybody over the age of 16 who shows up that day to get vaccinated. And so I feel like we will probably be able to make a bigger dent uh, in getting areas vaccinated in combination of, you know, making sure that we have put some priority on the, the patients with more, um, you know, medically complex conditions. So to me, it just feels like that might be the right way to go would be down that pathway. Thank you, Dr. Wyatt. I see just a quick uh, note in the chat here from Dr. Wakeman, strongly supporting not enforcing these priorities when we are dealing with small towns, incarcerated people, and any other groups where such a strategy makes sense. Thank you, Dr. Wakeman. Any other comments? Um, go ahead and put your hand up if there's anything else you'd like to share. All right, I don't see anything new coming in unless I missed anything. Or sorry, team will correct me if I miss anything. Very good. I think that's all we have on this, Dr. Burgess. 
Yeah, and then we have some uh, we have another topic to discuss that I think Elsie is going to introduce uh, that will be kind of a precursor to up our upcoming meeting. So next slide, please. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> and I just want to make sure, Dr. White, I know you had your hand up a moment ago. You're good. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so as we talked about last week when we were taking our votes, if you recall, one of the items that we were discussing was around congregate living settings. And we didn't really quite get through everything um, because of timing, which seems to be our arch rival <laughs> in these meetings over time. Um, but we wanted to have a chance just to, to bring some things forward to you because we're going to have this coming forward for more discussion next week because we want to make sure that everybody has the chance to think about this a little bit more. So we are giving you some more information today. And I uh, wanted to um, point out a few things that are on these slides. So as you can see from the top here, people living in congregate settings, they are at a higher risk um, of getting COVID-19, but there's not really any consensus around which groups are included in congregate living. It's sort of a very broad term. Um, and so the, those definitions are so broad, they could include everyone not living in a single family home. So we wanted to talk to you all about um, the fact that we already have some settings that congregate, congregate group settings that uh, we've already prioritized, which I'll show you in the next slide. But next week we wanted, to, and then we have a couple of more slides to show you some other uh, ways of potentially defining congregate living. So um, you have better informed decision-making next week. So next slide, please. So this is just a reminder of the, the congregate living settings that you have already taken action on. So as you know, we've already talked about long-term care facilities and you have, uh, we have prioritized both staff and residents, uh, independent living facilities attached to residential living facilities. They are, we have already prioritized them uh, for staff and for residents. And you can see that the Federal Pharmacy Partnership is also supporting that. And I don't need to read through every line, but essentially you can see that we've made some uh, progress in a lot of different situations uh, where people live in a congregate setting. So I guess I should review a few of these just so um, in case people can't read the slides. So we have adult daycare facilities, intermediate care facilities for individuals with intellectual disabilities, certified family homes, residential schools and facilities providing behavioral health uh, treatment. We've also addressed correctional and detention facilities just for staff at this point, and also homeless shelters. So on the next slide, uh, we're providing you um, some proposed congregate settings and some discussion, just some back pocket for you for next week. So if we want to look at um, some of these, there, here's some, some considerations. And we need to think about you know, what population groups we've already voted in and prioritized to be receiving the vaccine. And then if there's something in particular that warrants further separate action from the path that you're already taking. Is there a, you know, a definition that helps you um, that think about those um, decisions that you'd be making? For example, taking further action on the third line there for correction and detention facilities for adults. Um, this would be looking at um, the, not the staff that we've already prioritized, but the general population in some of these settings. Uh, dormitory housing for workers, uh, just a note at the bottom about what it does and does not mean. Um, so we have, uh, this could mean first responders, it could mean recreation and tourism staff living in a, uh, like a resort community, for example, that are brought in international individuals, it perhaps even, or people across the U.S. are coming together to work in a resort community. Uh, so. Just wanted to leave this up here for the sake of conversation and see if people have any thoughts about this and um, ideas for next week. Again, no vote is being taken, but just an opportunity for us to have a conversation around it. 
Excellent. Thank you, Elke. I'm checking now to see who has comments or questions on these topics. And so far, I don't see any hands up. So we'll just give a couple minutes to process what's been said and bring any questions or comments forward. Uh, Dr. Davids, go ahead, please. Thanks. Um, uh, so over uh, where I work at um, fMRI, we do a lot of work with uh, the shelters and folks experiencing homelessness. Um, I can tell you that we definitely have included uh, domestic violence and abuse shelters already with the homeless shelter group and are already vaccinating folks there. Um, but I think they should be included as congregate settings. People are there, you know, transitionally. Um, I would make a strong plug to include um, the substance use, um, the sober living facilities and the other um, substance use treatment centers. Those often over overlap, um, those communities often overlap and people often do not have anywhere else to live um, while they are staying in those facilities and they are shared bathrooms and um, you know lots of shared spaces in those facilities. And um, when we, we've had COVID outbreaks in those places and um, have taken care of folks in our hotel that we've used for other individuals um, experiencing homelessness the same way. So um, so I would say those are all kind of under that umbrella of, um, you know, housing instability um, individuals. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davids. Uh, I have a question in the chat. Just want to make sure I don't miss anything here. All right. Are those in this is from Dr. Wyatt. Are those incarcerated who otherwise meet age criteria getting access to vaccine at this time? This is Chris Hahn. Yes, they are. We meet with them. We talk with IDOC weekly uh, and make sure they're up to speed. Um, and they are, they've already vaccinated. They're 65 and older. They're um, folks, some of their uh, folks live in uh, long term care type settings. Um, and they're poised to start with their 55 year olds when that opens up. So they're, we're, we try very much to stay in touch with them to try to make sure that's happening. While I have the mic though, I was, I was going to just make another comment just to kind of throw it out there because I was surprised that we hadn't have any comments on that. The dormitory housing for students, you know, as we talk about congregate settings, Everyone we've looked at so far, if you look above, I think we've been talking about for a long time, you know, people um, obviously related to the homeless population, people in transitional housing, people in recovery, uh, but dormitory housing in theory could open it up to, you know, healthy 17 year olds uh, kind of thing. So I just wanted to throw that out there if how people feel about including them in the congregate setting. Um, if we if we if we sort of recommend this group go wherever we decide to put them as a group, um, bringing those um, dorm students in, obviously it's just a different population, different age group. Just wanted to hear people's thoughts about that if if people want. Thank you, Dr. Han. I see, let me see. I see a, a comment in the chat since it's not moving too quickly. I'll take this one. I don't want don't mean to to take any uh, our chat monitors. Uh, roll away, but I'm just trying to multitask here. Dr. Wyatt says, agree with Dr. Davids. The examples of congregate settings that have not yet been included in vaccine tiers continue to be high risk for hot zones of transmission. So from a public health standpoint, getting these groups vaccinated would be a good idea. And then Mel Levitin has her hand up. Go ahead, Mel. I just quickly want to say I, I too um, agree with Dr. Davids. I, I think including those groups is super important. Um, a question about the dormitory housing for students. Um, are we primarily talking then about when we're talking about that group, is that primarily college students we're talking about? When you're talking about dormitory, I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding which, what kind of students. Yeah, this is Chris Hahn, and I don't know if Chris Carter wants to speak up as well, but because uh, we've been working on this, and Dr. Witte, who I don't know if she's on the call right now, but um, yes, I that in my mind is exactly what we're talking about with that group would be uh, college students. Chris and, um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Was there anything I was, else? I was just. Sorry, there's just there are some um, 
like the Idaho Youth Academy, for example, that's not a university setting, but it's a residential school um, where they're living in dormitory settings. So it's not, it could cover other than university students. Yeah, and this is Mel, and that, that, was, that was the group I was after. Was that Chris that was making that comment? That was the group I was after, was the, the kids that are in a residential school kind of setting. Those I would be concerned about, but the, but the college dorm, I mean, you know, they're important. I don't mean to say that they're not by any means, but I, don't, I, think, they're, I think they're in a different group than somebody who lives in SHIP. Personally. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for those clarifications. Uh, Josh Tewalt, please go ahead. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, and as a non voting member, I just I, I did want to just add some comments on the, the correctional and detentional facilities. And as Dr. Han pointed out, uh, we work with the department regularly and, and we've appreciated that. And in addition to uh, you know, the age banding and, and those folks in our custody who are eligible. Uh, we also have a number of people in custody who work in essential jobs uh, in food processing, et cetera. So we're also preparing those numbers to be included uh, when, when their eligibility commences. Uh, but I, I did want to talk a little bit about, uh, a, you know, some issues that, that we do have in in not prioritizing these populations in general. And, and in addition to, you know, the obvious public health uh, concerns, I mean, we know that that the the transmission rates are higher when uh, for people who are in, in prisons or adult detention facilities. Uh, we release uh, almost 500 people a month that are returning to our communities. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, there there is a very real public health requirement or, or necessity to to give some further consideration to prioritizing this group before the public at large. But beyond that, there's also a legal uh, issue that that I don't think we've really addressed in in this city, and that is acknowledging that that the people who are sentenced to our custody, be it the Department of Correction or in, in county detention facilities across the state, state of Idaho, uh, we have a, a legal obligation to provide um, for their care and custody uh, through both state and, and federal law. And, and there already are, are court cases that, have, that are, are now precedent in the Ninth Circuit, one out of Oregon in particular, where, where we've acknowledged the increased risk in these settings by prioritizing uh, the staff who work in these settings, uh, but have, have not afforded that same priority to the people who live in these settings. And, and at least uh, in Oregon, uh, the Oregon Department of Correction was found to be deliberately indifferent uh, in, in those prioritizations. So I, I just wanted to at least talk about, uh, number one, we are, working as fast as we can to to uh, acquire vaccine and get it administered to everyone in our custody who is eligible. Uh, but um, also just wanted to note that in addition to the public health issues, uh, we also have some legal requirements that are certainly at the forefront of our minds. So appreciate the opportunity to share that. Thank you so much. Very important perspectives. For everyone to consider. So with that, I do see a comment in the chat from Christine Newhoff. Would we or could we have those living in dormitory housing for students follow the 16 to 44 with high risk health conditions and other congregate settings at the same time or before the 16 to 44 with high risk health conditions? So um, I don't know if uh, Christine, you want to come on and, and provide some more on your thought there, or if anyone has uh, some answers or other things to add to that. Yeah, Question. just um, after listening to um, Dr. Wyatt's comments and the last comments about um, some of these other congregate settings and the the risk of transmission, the transmission in those settings and um, and the, the recognition uh, of, uh, of the risk at the correctional facilities to the extent that we've already vaccinated um, or at least prioritized. 
the uh, those who work in correctional facilities, you know, maybe it maybe it makes sense for them to come uh, somewhat earlier. Maybe it's at the same time as the 16 to 44. I'm not wedded to this. I'm just asking if we can separate the dormitory housing for students, which are likely to be predominantly healthy people between the ages of 17 and 22. Uh, prioritize them differently than these other congregate settings. Thank you, Christine. Any further comment on that? All right, thank you. I would like to turn to Dr. Wakeman, uh, who has her hand up. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I don't know that college dormitories need to be really high, but but they are super spreaders. Um, that they are young, and they are immortal, and they don't follow rules, and they they pass viruses around in a major way. Thank you, Dr. Wakeman. And let me take a look here. Uh, Dr. Homso says agree with prioritiz prioritizing corrections. And I don't see any other hands up at this time. So if you have further comments or questions to share, this would be a great time. I still have a few minutes. Oh, Linda Smonstrom has her hand up. Go ahead, Linda, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a, a quick question. So we were going down the path of A or B in age banding. And so what we're debating here is essentially inserting a subgroup within that age banding. I just want to make sure I'm I'm internalizing the, the question appropriately. And, and if we don't um, pull this out and put it, you know, it's someplace in that 16 to 24 banding space, then the individuals that are covered here would just fall into their age group when it becomes available. Am I correct in that understanding? That's correct, Linda. This yeah, is I think that, Oh, sorry. Please. No, I think we should say the same thing. I think this, this will be up for vote at our next meeting, whether to separate this group out or have them fold into the age um, okay, thank, bracket. Thank you. I appreciate that. Excellent. Thank you. Let me check back and see if we have any hands up. I don't see any other hands up at this time. And I don't see any other chat comments. Team, have I missed anything at all in the chat? Uh, Dr. White, and I'm sorry if we, uh, and this is Dr. Wyatt had a question. If we separate out where they fall, and I'm sorry if that just got, I was looking through the chat, so I might have missed the, some of the conversation. Excellent. I think that one just popped in. Thank you, Dr. Hahn. If we separate out, where do they fall? So. Sounds like we might have been starting to address that, but any further comment on that? Well, that will be part of the vote. You know, we'll have to give you some choices uh, next week to determine if they go, you know, in between some of those groups or in front or, you know, where exactly they should go if, if, they, if they're separate, if separated out. Yeah, and I'll, I'll refresh everybody's memory from last week. We had a, a table and you had, I think, options A, B, C, or D. Uh, so one of them was, do you want to include congregate setting? Uh, do you want to not prior? I'm just trying to put this off the top of my head, so my apologies. I don't remember all the options right now. But one of them was, we don't prioritize this group. Similarly uh, to our vote or your vote on essential, the, the rest of the essential workers, and that anybody in congregate settings would just be eligible for vaccine when their age group came up. Or there was a variety of votes following that. One was, do we do them simultaneously with any group that's running? Do we put them in some other uh, level of our priority? So there were several different options. So we just want to have an opportunity for conversation about that so we can go back to that vote and you can make some uh, choices. Thank you for that. It looks like we're getting close to the end of our time together. I don't see any other uh, member hands up or uh, chats, I don't believe. Let's just Not double check any either. Okay. Very good. All right. Well, with that, it looks like we might be ready to close for our meeting today. So perhaps we could go to our next slide.
while we're waiting for the slide, I have the slides here, so I can I can move forward into our wrap up. Natalie, if you could advance the slides, that'd be great. Uh, so into our meeting summary, today we had a great presentation uh, from Salome Mawanji about the uh, refugee community and different considerations, not just for the refugee community. I'm trying to remember the, the wording, um, but others with uh, proficiency in um, health literacy, English proficiency in health literacy and other considerations. And so thank you again, Salome, for that great presentation. Um, and then we spent most of our time talking about those remaining considerations for group three. We started out talking about the age bands and health risk, the pending vote on that, and then also spent time talking about our congruent living conditions and how those should be prioritized. And we will finalize on that at our meeting next Friday. So that's what we covered today in terms of Action items and next steps, as you all know, we have that vote that Elke uh, reminded us in the beginning. I think it was Elke, maybe it was Dr. Burgess, about the fact that we extended that vote until Monday morning, I believe. Yes, 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock, thank you. I couldn't remember the time. So please make sure you get those votes in so that we can process that information and get everything ready for our next meeting. Uh, you'll be seeing your meeting materials uh, likely end of day on Monday. And... Uh, our next meeting, as you know, is scheduled for next Friday. That will be a regular two hour meeting, 12 to two. And uh, depending on how uh, far we can get there, well, we have a tentative meeting set for, I believe the week after that. And that's where we are with our schedule at this point. So I think that's all that I have. I got a note that internet went down in terms of switching the slides. So of course that happens. We've all experienced that over the last year and I'm sure before that as well. So no problem. We've got our backup notes here. I wanna thank everyone for your comments and, and uh, discussion today. And again, thanks to our whole staff team and everyone who puts this together. Um, it is a lot of work from a lot of different um, ends. So thank you everyone. With that, I'd like to turn it back to Dr. Burgess and Elke for closing remarks. Great, thank you. Oh, sorry, I was Go thinking ahead. that I might be able to, um, I'm now the host, but I don't, I can't see that I can share any slides, so <laughs> high apologies. But I, yeah, I just wanna say thank you to everybody for participating in today, today and we really appreciate it. And I'm just gonna turn it back over to Dr. Burgess. Yep, we'll see you next week. Uh, it's possible that could be our last meeting, but we don't want to promise anything because uh, things might come up, but uh, we are definitely near the end of our work and appreciate uh, all of your hard work. I think, uh, as you know, we've, as a state, uh, done better and better as we've gotten more vaccine and we're doing very good at getting it out and starting to see some results, which is really exciting. So thank you all and we'll see you next week. Great. Thank you. We're adjourned.